so um, so this work is the this is the third chapter of my three chapter dissertation that I'm finishing this semester. Um, and let me make sure that I can see every, there we go. Um, so I've been just a little background. I've been going out to the Rohingya camps since early 2017, um, since before the camps were in the news when they became a massive mega camp. Like I think it's, it, it might still be the largest refugee camp in the world with a million people. So I just by coincidence um, ended up there just to see if I could conduct research. I ended up there before um, all the aid agencies showed up and before um, there was the massive arrival in August 2017. So this um, this third uh, article is looking at basically how just seeing how the huge amount of overlapping and fractured jurisdiction that controls both inside the camp and outside the camp has really changed the relationship between um, Rohingya uh, people and the local Bangladeshi population. And these two populations have had a, a long-term relationship for hundreds of years um, that was disrupted by uh, the British uh, drawing of the border in 1948, but that's not part of this. But I do wanna say that the, the people that I met um, uh, have had long-term relationships um, and uh, even people who are um, from the Bangladeshi side took refuge with Rohingya people during the 1971 War of Independence. So there is a long uh, relationship that is being heavily influenced by aid agencies um, and aid agencies <laughs> that I talk to really have uh, actually no, no clue of how to address um, the conflict that is coming up uh, linked to aid policies. So. Um, I started thinking of this um, this particular chapter when uh, when I was here in Albuquerque, New Mexico, um, uh, in in 2018. I was here just visiting my home in between research, and I was really shocked. And I know I shouldn't be shocked, but it, it was shocking to me to see the huge um, anti-caravan, anti-migrant caravan response in Tijuana by. Um, the Mexican populations. And I started wondering um, uh, why was it in this particular city that there was such a huge um, anti-caravan uh, response. Um, and it was even people that uh, were interviewed, people who were moving from Southern Mexico and Honduras and Guatemala, they, were, they themselves were shocked at this response at, at, in Tijuana. So I started wondering, um, uh, was it the specter of a border camp, which we now know exists? There are border camps. What was it that drove this fear um, and the, the the xenophobia against people that didn't even want to settle in Mexico, people that were trying to cross the border into the United States? Um, so I started thinking about uh, what is this ambiguous fear of refugees and asylum seekers? Because a lot of people that I've talked to here in the United States they don't always necessarily have a concrete reason why they're so afraid of migrants or asylum seekers or refugees. Um, uh, and how do we document and differentiate impacts that are could be linked to the actual just the presence of refugees or asylum seekers and then the impacts of the humanitarian aid regime, which has largely escaped critique over the years of what exactly the policies are doing because we do have a tendency to fall into this white savior syndrome and this idea that um, this is what we're supposed to do um, through all of these compacts uh, that were put together by the United Nations. But there is um, a growing uh, set of research that is like skate looking up, looking up at what's happening with the aid agencies and not just focusing on what refugees are doing and refugee lives and asylum seeker lives, but we need to grow that field. Um, and how do we mitigate the adverse effects on host communities, as well as mitigate, mitigating the anti-refugee xenophobia that is linked to some of those adverse effects and also unpacking the term of host community. Um, so these are just some of the broader questions I have of what is a host community? It's not a homogenous group. Um, it's not just one set of people. Um, are they truly hosting? These are some of the questions I look at in the entire dissertation that I that I also focus on here in this um, particular article. 
So as we know, richer countries such as the US, the, the West, um, they've been fortifying borders against letting in um, refugees and asylum seekers. Um, but since 85% of protracted refugee situations, which are camps of five years or more, are now in developing countries in the global south, um, these countries in the north are dependent on developing countries to host all of these uh, people who are um, uh, forced migrants, refugees. Um, and so, um, but this hosting also affects populations that are not the targets of international humanitarian aid. And I chose Bangladesh because it is now the largest refugee camp in the world. Um, and for more than 40 years, there were hundreds of thousands of Rohingya um, as undocumented Myanmar nationals is what they were called when I first went. And they had no aid at all. And when I went in 2017, there were 300,000 um, undocumented Myanmar nationals. They weren't even allowed to call themselves Rohingya. They just got along with nothing. They had no aid, um, no official help from the UN except for one small camp that I'll point out. Um, and suddenly, um, in August 2017, um, there was a huge arrival of aid agencies, hundreds of aid agencies arrived, um, and it's now a $1.63 billion response. Um, and that's when we started to see a huge um, rift growing between uh, the local population and um, the refugee population. And I want to point out that this protracted refugee situation um, is not necessarily unique or exceptional just because of its size, but because I think what we're looking at is something that is going to represent the future of global refugee containment um, if we don't start reanalyzing uh, how the humanitarian aid regime is working um, both for people in the global north and in the global south. Um, and so this, so my, my aim is that I'm contributing to this ongoing debate about refugee containment and what refugee containment does um, and the implications of the humani of humanitarian aid in refugee policy creation and implications in, in increasing xenophobia that's against refugees and asylum seekers. So these are a few slides that I just pulled from Google Maps that just show the explosion of the camp area. Um, so the top uh, left in 2002, it was it was it was a, a fraction of the size it is now. So that is the Kutubalong refugee camp. That camp in the top left is the camp that the United Nations was allowed to officially run just for a few years, and then the borders were closed. The government of Bangladesh had them close the borders. Um, and then you can see below that is, is 2013, it grew a little bit more than 2017. And then suddenly, January 2018, it's, it was taking over 43 square kilometers of, of forest. Um, so the, the expanse um, just blew up. And what we can see here is there is a huge number of um, overlapping jurisdiction within and, and inside and outside the camp that's just the fact that in 2002, the government of Bangladesh could force the UN to close the borders of the official camp shows the power of um, the jurisdiction of the government of Bangladesh. Um, so there is jurisdiction happening inside the camp. There is jurisdiction happening outside the camp and none of them necessarily work together. So this is the Kutubalong camp and this is what it is now. Up in the top corner that A is where the Kutubalong camp was now and you can see the, the camp as of, this is February, 2018, it's, it's even bigger now. And there's other sections of camps, um, but this is what's considered the mega camp. It's taken out 5,000 acres of coastal forest. Um, and this shows the density of um, this camp. Um, and and within, within just this kind of landscape, it, it's very hard to tell when you're in this giant camp the maze of who has jurisdiction over one, because there's the United Nations, there's UNICEF, there's, uh, which includes UNICEF, uh, um, UNHCR and the IOM, which is not a refugee agency, but somehow they're still there. Um, and then all of the, the smattering of aid organizations all the way from Oxfam to the smallest little local NGO that could be out of um, Bangladesh itself. So they're all working um, in these camps and all have different um, 
uh, ideas about what happens in their tiny slice of this camp. Um, so in May 2017, when I first went, this is what the camp interior looked like. There was space, there was, there was trees, um, and the borders um, were basically imaginary. Like I could walk in and out of the camp, that nobody questioned me. There was, it was um, not very militarized. Um, Rohingya people could cross the border to have work um, in fish drying plants, which was the work of a lot of women found in hotels as rickshaw drivers. And because of the linguistic um, similarities um, and because of the just the physicality that of people looking like people just didn't really tell Rohingya people from Bangladeshi people unless you asked for an identification. So it was kind of like a don't ask, don't tell. Um, uh, policy and and a lot of a lot of people grew up in these camps. I mean, these camps are more than forty years old. So people who were there for more than a few years learned to speak the local dialect. Um, and some uh, Rohingya families would place people inside the camp to get aid, and other people outside the camp so that they could work. So they they did find ways to manage um, this camp situation where there was no regular aid coming in. Um, the camp provided some marginal protection, but there was a hierarchy between the 40,000 um, Rohingya who were in that, that actual um, official uh, UNHCR run camp and then unregistered refugees, which again were called undocumented Myanmar nationals, and then Bangladeshi host community members were at the highest level of, um, of this hierarchy. However, people that I talked to then said there was very little conflict between families. Families worked together, um, hiring each other. Uh, a lot of um, Bangladeshi families that I met helped Rohingya children go to schools with, with falsified papers. There was some working in between families. Then just a few months later, the camp became this. It became super dense. Um, there were the borders hardened, and now some of you may know that there's now a fence around, um, which was which was a horrible thing that happened. In January 2018, a flood of aid showed up. The Bangladeshi government finally said, once there were 750,000 people that showed up within three weeks, they finally allowed the UN to come in and and do what they needed to do. So then there became multiple roadblocks and identity checks. Um, uh, everyone had to have state issued identification, even Bangladeshi people. Um, there was growing conflict between the IOM and the UNHCR. And this is when anti-Rohingya and anti-NGO sentiment began to grow in the host community because their whole lives were being rocked by this huge camp. Um, and the host community members started to point to these aid policies that were impacting them, but they were basically invisible to aid agencies. So refugee aid was impacting non-refugees but donors aren't giving money to aid agencies to work with non-refugees. So they were basically invisible. In the host community itself, this, so this is the community I lived in Jadimura um, and it's a mix. You can see there's some rural, there's some semi-rural. Ukia is the, the city. This was before aid agencies showed up, this road was completely destroyed um, and, and it just became massive just getting through this town which normally took about 10 minutes before now can take two hours the the traffic became horrible um and then there's also cox's bazaar and that's about one hour from the camps and that's a tourist destination for bangladesh um, it's also where all most of the aid aid, aid workers live um, and there's lots of hotels and rooftop pools and parties and um, it's become a, a it, in this refugee situation, they've gotten more in, uh, money than they would have ever gotten organically. So um, again, when we talk about host community people, business owners in Cox's Bazaar are considered host community, but there's, their experience is very different than people who are living next to the camp and the Bangladeshi people that have been forcibly included into the camp, who have been surrounded by the camp, who are basically living a camp life, but are not refugees and cannot get aid. Um, so there's a range of impacts on Bangladeshi people. So, but when things started to go bad, a lot of the blame fell on the shoulders of the Rohingya 
um, and it grew. I could see the, in the multiple trips there as I went year after year, um, the critique of the Rohingya being here, of wanting them to go back, um, was growing with every every few months that passed. And there was little critical analysis of the uneven aid practices um, uh, and how each piece of jurisdiction had a different, different way of um, managing not only the camp, but also the way the government of Bangladesh managed everything outside the camp. Um, so this fractured jurisdiction, um, it is uh, asserted in a variety of formal and informal ways. Um, some of them are, have actual hard boundaries, and a lot of them, uh, a lot of this overlapping jurisdiction just has to do with what donors want. Um, Oxfam has different donors than um, the than Brock, which is a giant Bangladeshi uh, NGO, has different donors than um, uh, you know. If aid comes directly from Sweden, that government of Sweden has exactly what they want to see done with their money. So all of this earmarking creates a very um, challenging patchwork where you can see one part of the camp is beautifully put together. For, for the camp of what it is and the others and just right next to it there's a camp that doesn't have um, adequate toilets um, and the, the sheds are falling down and they they have really nothing and and so within the camp there's this fractured jurisdiction um, and outside the camp there is a fractured jurisdiction where the government of Bangladesh is technically in charge but as we see as I'll show everything outside the camp is also um, impacted by all the aid agencies that work inside the camp because they need places to live, they need places to build all their structures, they need places to have warehouses for materials. So this camp jurisdiction is more than just a territorial jigsaw puzzle. It also differentiates how things are governed. Um, and uh, so that's what I focus on and that's from Mariana Valverde's work on jurisdiction. So the four pieces that I looked at in this paper are access, labor, ecology, and temporality. Um, and I used WASH, the water, sanitation, and hygiene um, sector as the case study for where this plays out. So I show how this fractured jurisdiction plays out in the water, sanitation, and hygiene. So this is the sector that is responsible for creating wells, um, latrines, wastewater treatment plants, solid waste management, and training on hygiene. For example, right now, the wash sector is in charge of um, making sure people have enough hand washing stations during COVID. They were the ones in charge of making sure people got immunizations when there was a diphtheria outbreak. Um, so wash, the wash sector, I noticed when I was there, what you're seeing now, this picture is of a, a construction site where they make components for toilets, for millions of toilets inside the camp because toilets keep needing uh, um, uh, to be rebuilt. So, um, so outside the camp, um, these have taken over land that used to be um, for food production. So for this particular um, this particular wash um, site is behind the house that I was living in. And this land used to be where the women that lived in this house grew the vegetables for their home. And then aid agencies showed up and wanted to have land to build all these toilets. And uh, a local politician, the one who represents this household, decided to build, I, I could see this all outside of my bedroom window, watching him build this site. Um, and it destroyed all of the land that the women in this village were using to do household vegetable production. So land use changes. And this is one of literally thousands of sites that you see when you, when you drive around the camps, but this is the one I was closest to. And so these camps not only take up land, but they also take up water resources. The other part that washes is um, very infrastructure heavy are wells. And most of the wells were unmonitored. Um, so uh, when water was coming out of the wells, uh, there was no monitoring of what was happening outside the camp boundaries. And of course, all of these um, communities share the same aquifer. So people that I was talking to in the host community said that their water was starting to come up brackish, salty, and red, which is an indication of seawater intrusion, which means that the aquifer was being sucked dry 
and there was absolutely no monitoring of what was happening in the wells outside the camp. There was some very beginnings of monitoring when I was there in the end of 2019, but it, for, for two years, there was no monitoring of these wells. The other, so those, those are some of the, the impacts to, to land. The other piece that this very infrastructure heavy part of WASH is that there was a huge loss of local jobs. Um, so manual laborers um, charge normally $5 a day to do manual labor in, in, uh, in and around the Rohingya camps. However, because the Rohingya were, were completely um, left out of any hiring practices, the government of Bangladesh said that they are, are not allowed to be hired for any work. They, of course, like every uh, like most communities that are uh, pushed out of the, the, the legal work sector started to work under the table for $2 an hour, $2 a day, I'm sorry. So all these NGOs are building all of these wash components and they need labor. They're not, they're not concerned with the contractors who, who the contractors are hiring. So they didn't realize that most of the contractors that I interviewed were hiring Rohingya people to work outside the camp, which is illegal. And this meant that most of the Bangladeshi laborers that normally would have these jobs lost their jobs because they were asking for their regular $5 a day wage, but Rohingya, because they were working under the table, were hired at cut rate wages. Um, so the loss of jobs was huge for the Bangladeshi manual labor um, sector. And these are the poorest of the poor households there. Um, of course, some households did gain some labor um, and the, in the households where people spoke English, but many of those people came from larger cities like Dhaka and Chittagong, um, and a lot of them were very young people. But, um, but most adults who were doing manual labor before not only lost land, but they also lost their jobs um, because aid agencies were not tracking who was making all of the components for WASH. Um, another sector that I looked at were eco ecological impacts. So this is what the forests looked like in May 2017. This is where I, I went with, with a Rohingya friend of mine. This is the same region just months later, from May 2017 to January 2018. Um, and when we were in the forest, there, are, there were elephants in this forest. There were, you know, all kinds of wildlife, but people were removing some firewood here and there. But this large scale deforestation happened um, because aid agencies at the request of the Bangladeshi government did not hand out any cooking fuel to a million people. They handed out dry rice and lentils and then no cooking fuel. So then everybody cut down trees very quickly. So this increases um, landslides, um, it decreases the surface water quality, which many of the local people were dependent on collecting surface water. Um, and uh, uh, it also um, uh, made, so this firewood and leaf collection is a gender-based job, which is left often to women and girls, and they had to go further and further out to collect firewood, and they were um, reporting very high levels of assault and rape during these um, fuel wood collections and there was there have been every year several deaths including of children because now mudslides are are um, deadly even more deadly than they were before the host community also lost this land when this was um, forest land this is where the host community would go during floods and cyclones but now this land is even more dangerous than, than the land that they live on. So it has also increased um, the host community's impacts um, when they're impacted by cyclones and flooding. So this is also an example of fractured jurisdiction, the Bangladeshi government putting one policy of no cooking fuel, and then the food sector continuing to give out dry food, uh, and then not having any uh, petroleum or, or gas, natural gas, um, distribution until late 2019. So two years of deforestation people lived through. Um, right, so the consequences of food aid, po food aid policies were surface and groundwater degradation, um, high reports of assault, rape, and death linked to fuel collection, mostly for women and girls, um, and there was no high ground for refuge during cyclones. Um, and it also caused 
um, this containment policies also caused a destruction of food production for these 68 Bangladeshi families that were that found themselves contained by this is just in one section of the camp, there were 68 families that I met and then I met more in other parts of the camp as the camp grew 68 families lost their rice paddy so this is a photo of this was a rice paddy that was um, production for for a family, um, and it was completely destroyed. And there was the neither the aid agencies or the Bangladeshi government came up with any kind of reparations for these families. Um, so there's a question in the back of my mind of is this loss of land going to cause a secondary migration? Is the loss of water going to cause secondary migration? And then it also makes me think about if people are migrating out of Bangladesh or internal migration, are they gonna be considered climate migrants or are, they, or are they migrants that are actually victims of uh, a poorly managed um, refugee camp? And then what is that? Are they, then are they also like secondary victims of a conflict? Um, so those are questions that I, 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 I still wanna answer in another paper, but, but I still think about how these families are going to be considered um, when they begin to migrate out. Finally, uh, well, almost finally, loss of access. So the women, uh, for example, um, uh, Fatima, she and her daughters spent six years saving up to build a well and a toilet. Um, and she, she's a widow. Um, and she lost her toilet when a, 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 contra, a local politician that was working for an NGO decided to make a, um, a production plant and, and commandeer her well and her toilet. And this happened to a lot of different people. They just lost land because more powerful people would come in and just say, now we're gonna work for the NGOs because the NGOs paid so much money. So she has no toilet or water access anymore. Um, and now she has to get her water from a neighbor and use a neighbor's toilet. Um, so she's a person of one of many people who worked very hard to, to produce her own wash, to get her own well, to make her own toilet. And then she lost it when um, uh, aid agencies um, were not paying attention to who was affected by their production outside of the camp. Um, I'm gonna go past that. So finally, the final piece of jurisdiction is temporality. So the government of Bangladesh has made a rule that says nothing in the camp can be tempor can be permanent. They have this idea that the Rohingya are going to all move on. Um, so as UNICEF is in charge of the wash and, and the, high, the higher level UNICEF worker or manager said, is there any place in the world today where we need to make a water system for 1 million people but can't make a permanent structure? So everything that they make with WASH has to be temporary. In, so as you can see here, all of these green boxes in the middle, those are temporary toilets. They have no toilet rings. Um, everything has to be made with bamboo, which is a huge drain on the bamboo, um, all of that whole region, because these houses don't stand up to, to any cyclones. Um, all of this temporality, this overlay of jurisdiction of the Bangladeshi government to say nothing can be permanent has really impacted the quality of inside the camp, which also means that there has to be constant production outside the camp because there's no space inside the camp. Constant toilet production, constant cutting of bamboo, constant um, warehousing of materials to replace these temporary structures that have been housing people now for years. So some of the tentative conclusions I've come up with that is that we really need to start picking apart what it means to be a host community because all of these people um, that are non-refugees are being impacted by refugee policies. Um, uh, it, some of them are impacted in ways where they're benefiting, but the majority of people are not. Um, and uh, how can governments, aid agencies, and donor countries recognize their impacts on host communities often without even being there. Um, some of this money, the majority of the money that is coming from donor countries um, is earmarked without even understanding what's happening on the ground, without understanding um, what money is needed where. Um, and who takes responsibility for the production and vulnerability of these populations that are not necessarily, in, they're not inherently vulnerable. Women are not inherently vulnerable. Refugee families are not inherently vulnerable, but they're produced as vulnerable when they're um, denied basic rights 
such as the right to education, the right to work, the right to be able to buy the materials they need. Um, and that also has a secondary impact on the host communities that live near them, because then it forces people to have to go into um, uh, under the table work, including sex work, including um, very cut rate and precarious labor. Um, and so the desire for these wash services, for example, in the host community, has always been there. And most people in the host community funded and made their wash structures on their own with no help from the government. Um, so now when aid agencies arrived, um, uh, people who knew that they were responsible, knew that they were never going to get any help from their government, suddenly saw um, all of these wash um, structures show up um, for free um, inside the camp. And that created a huge wash envy. Um, and that also inc increased this resentment against um, Rohingya refugees by host community members. Um, so it's some of the some of some of the, the the fracture jurisdiction also makes some of the wash inside the camp is wonderfully made. And people, some aid agencies have completely ignored the idea of temporality and made beautiful structures with drainage and hand washing facilities and soap and roofs and um, uh, wheelchair accessible. Um, uh, bars for, for pregnant people to be able to use the toilets in a more comfortable way. They've made wonderful wash, some, some NGOs, um, and other ones are just horribly done. Um, but uh, all of the, most of the, the wash that's happening inside the camp is uh, based on a structure that is much higher quality than what people are able to build outside the camp. So that creates another level of conflict for people outside the camp. So finally, I think that the aid regime needs to reevaluate the unintended impacts of this fractured jurisdiction um, on both the targeted populations, which are refugees here, and these invisibilized local populations who are hugely impacted. Um, and this also includes evaluating if simply giving money for refugee camps in the global south, does this make up for closing our borders um, and for not addressing the issues that are pushing people to move, such as climate change and political conflict. Um, and in this case, um, Rohingya have showed up because of a political, uh, politically fueled genocide, um, but people that were already in this area were already feeling impacts of climate change. Um, so all of this has compounded for both Rohingya populations and host community populations and um, the fractured jurisdiction between the government and all of the aid agencies and the United Nations agencies and donors in the West um, has created a, a brewing conflict between both Rohingya and uh, local populations. So that's my study. Mm -hmm.